This conference will now be recorded. All right, so this is our introduction to Microsoft Excel. So let's jump in. Uh, let's talk about what we're going to do today. Let's talk about Excel more generally. We're going to review the fundamentals of spreadsheets so we know what we're doing in Excel. All right, it is the most advanced program we teach here, so it's good to lay the groundwork first before we even jump into the program. So today we're going to learn about the principles of spreadsheets. We're going to look at the Excel screen or window, okay? If you took our word class, this might seem familiar where we just kind of go over the lay of the land. We look at the work area, the tools that are offered and where those tools are located. Then we're gonna start entering and working with data. Okay, we're just gonna type some data into our sheets and build a, a simple yet very functioning worksheet or very functional worksheet, excuse me. We're gonna perform some simple calculations which will introduce you to using formulas in Excel. We're gonna select ranges of data, by that I just mean multiple data values, and format them. So once, ever, once we have all our calculations done, we're gonna format it, kind of make it look more presentable, especially if we want to print. All right, printing from Excel can be a bit challenging, so I'm gonna show you some good steps to take to ensure that your printed copy looks good. All right. And I should mention before we go any further that we are using Excel 2019 in this class, just like other, other, our other office classes. All right. Uh, so it is Excel 2019. As long as you have access to any version from 2007 or later, you'll find that whatever you learn in this class can be easily applied to those other versions. So what do we use Excel for? All right. It's not just for, you know, economics, finance, things like that. We could use it. Uh, it has everyday for, uh, practical purposes, all right? It is a program to organize information and numbers. Information and numbers are called data. So for example, Excel can help you make budgets, okay? A personal budget, household budget to help you organize your spending. Or maybe you could create a schedule to help organize your time. All right, also people often use Excel for surveys, okay? Um, you, it, uh, you can create a survey and use that data to find answers to questions. All right, see how things are going if you're running some kind of program. Uh, do people like it? Are there months of the year that it's more, you get more attendance than others? Things like that, okay? Excel helps you keep track of that sort of, uh, uh, it helps you keep track of data whether in the short term or in the long term so you can make better, more informed decisions. Now, spreadsheets, they allow you to organize information in tables, kind of like what you see here, okay? Now, Excel provides the added bonus of automatic mathematics, so it has calculations built in. Now, it will keep track of the data you place in cells, and if you define cells to refer to each other, any changes made in one cell will be reflected in the referring cells. All right, don't worry too much about what all that means right now. But basically it means that if I take a value like 15 here, like you see on the screen, and change it to maybe a 30, like we see down here, it will, depending on the calculations I have built into my spreadsheet or my worksheet, it will update those answers instantly and automatically. So again, I changed the 15 to a 30 and it then automatically changed these answers, and we'll talk about how all that works in just a moment. Some good terms to know. So the work area in Excel is a blank worksheet, which is laid out in a grid. So the more general term is a spreadsheet, but when we use Excel, we call them worksheets. Now, Excel worksheets are saved in a file known as a workbook, okay? So kind of like in Microsoft Word, we call the file a document. In Excel, we call it a workbook. And one workbook file can contain one or more worksheets. So we can create multiple worksheets in one workbook. Now in that grid, we use columns and rows. All right, and in those columns and rows, we enter data, which can be text or numbers or both. And then we perform calculations on that information. All right, so as I just mentioned, columns and rows. So this is an example of an Excel worksheet, kind of up close here. Now the rows, they run horizontally across the page. And as you can see, the rows are identified by number, one, two, three, et cetera. The columns, columns run vertically up and down the page. And columns are identified by letter, 
A, B, C, etc. Where those columns and rows intersect is where we have a cell. So each of the little rectangles in that grid, okay, where the column and the row meet up or intersect, okay, that's called a cell. And the cell that we're currently working on, we call it the active cell. So, um, and what's really important is what we call the cell, okay? We always identify a cell by the column letter followed by the row number. So this would be called the A1 cell. This would be A2, B2, B3, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll, we'll review that again when we get into the actual program. Now, another good thing to uh, look out for, okay, when you are um, in the program, we're, we're using our mouse a lot in Excel. And as we wave our mouse cursor around the screen, we're going to see it take different shapes depending on what we're about to do. So the very first one at the top looks like a big white cross. That's the one you're going to see most often, and that's a select cursor. All right, it allows us to select a cell or multiple cells, which we call a range of cells, to format them in some way, or maybe incorporate them into a mathematical calculation. Okay, so for example, if I wanna change a bunch of cells a different color, I would select those cells first and then apply the color, okay? Now, the next one down looks like a black cross, and this is a fill handle. And we can use this to copy formulas or values into other cells, okay? Now, don't, again, don't worry too much about what that means, but the big distinction here is that the select cursor selects the cell itself, the fill handle selects the contents inside the cell. So two different things. So the cell itself, and then the contents or value inside of that cell. The next one down you've probably seen before, this is the I-beam, okay? We see that I-beam typically when we are inside of a cell and we're either entering data or editing existing data. Finally, we have the two-headed arrow, a horizontal one and a vertical one, all right? We will see these when we need to resize columns or rows. All right, Excel does a lot of things automatically, but one thing it won't do automatically is resize columns and rows, which we often have to do to fit all of our data. So when we need to do that, I will be sure to let you know and you'll see how easy it is. Now, when we're in a cell, a cell can contain uh, the following types of data. We can have text data, number data, and or formulas. Text data is kind of like what we see here in this example in what we would call the range A1 through A6, okay? These are text data values, right? They're just words. Another important thing to remember though is that text data often acts, um, kind of has another duty in that it acts as a label. So in Excel, labels are very important for various reasons. You'll notice in row one, or more specifically, A1 through D1, we have labels set up. And those labels are, to, are there to help us identify the values underneath of them, okay? Because without the remaining label, for example, I might not know what the 16 is. So I need a label that, tell, that clearly tells me what those values are. Now, another kind of data value we can have in a cell is number data, which we see in B1 through C6. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, B2, excuse me, B2 to uh, B6 and then C2 to C6. I'm um, <clears throat> sorry about that. So, in this case, these are just numerical values that we've entered manually. So, we're just keeping track in this example of how many chocolate cookies we baked how many we sold, 36 and 20. And then we did the same for the other cookie types. Now, another kind of data value we can have in a cell is what you see in D2 through D6 here. This is a formula. Now, it looks like just regular numbers like we saw before. Uh, however, there's, an, there's a formula going on behind the scenes that you're not seeing. And that formula is calculating and providing our answer. So 16, 8, 12, 2, and 4. 
So for example, this formula in cell D2, where do you see the 16? That's subtracting 20 from 36 to give us 16. Okay, so that formula is referencing these two cells to give us an answer. And that is how we can have a formula in a cell. And we'll talk about building a formula in just one second. In fact, we're going to talk about it right now. So all formulas must begin with an equal sign. All right. Now, when we use Excel, as you get more experience, you can build formulas yourself. Just type it in. Okay. But we can also let Excel build the majority of it for us. But in either case, any formula, any and all formulas begin with the equal sign. Always, always, always. Now, when we type an equation, we do not type in the data. We enter the cell reference where the data is stored. Then when we change the data in any cell, the equation will be updated automatically upon the change or entry of any data that is referenced in the equation. What does all that mean? Let's look here. So once again, we have an Excel worksheet. Looks like we have columns D and E. And just to keep things simple, we're going to say that these are rows 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so this formula is going to add the numbers 3 and 2. So I can see that in cell E1, there's a 3. In cell E2, there's a 2. In cell E3, there's a formula because they put in the equal sign. And whoever did this wants to add 3 and 2. So when they build that formula, they're not going to say equals 3 plus 2. What they're going to say is what you see here, equals E1 plus E2. So this is what I was just talking about in the previous slide. We're always using cell references when we build our formulas, not the data itself. And we do that because the formula will automatically update the answer if the data in cells E1 and E2 change. So your column letters and your row numbers, again, we're pretending 1, 2, and 3, those will never change. Those are constants. You can't change them. They won't change. What does change in real life often is your data. Okay. So for example, if you're keeping track of your budget, maybe this month you're, um, you're making one last payment on whatever it is. Next month, it's all paid off. So that that's going to change. Or maybe um, you're upgrading to a different TV package. So that monthly payment is going to go up next month. So there's always changes in our data happening. So that's why we reference the cells, because if I change this 3 to a 6, this answer will automatically update to an 8. Because whatever's in cell E1 and whatever is in cell E2 is going to dictate this answer at all times. Now, I showed you this before, but this is, I blew it up a little bit. Just to show you what all this means on a slightly larger scale, okay, we have three formulas going on on this side, or I'm sorry, um, in both, excuse me. We have three formulas going on in this data set. So this is our original data set. This is our updated data set. Over here, we have a formula going on in cell B6, which is adding up the values B2 through B5, right, to give us 66. There's another formula going on in cell D2, which is multiplying the values in column B by the values in column C. 15 times 16, 65 gives you 249.75. And then we've applied that formula to the three remaining rows here. And then the third formula is in cell D6 down here, which is adding up D2 through D5 to give us a grand total. Now, in my updated data set, I changed the value in cell B2, which is 15, I change it to a 30. So any formula that references that cell, whether directly or indirectly, the answer to that formula is going to update. So that's why the 66 became an 81, 249.75 became 499.50, and 939.40 became 1189.15. So by changing one value, it updated all three 
instantly. All right, one more thing, again, um, not something we will necessarily need today, but I just want to review this with you in case you ever want to practice on your own. If you are building your own calculations, and we will do some of this next week, okay? These are your four mathematical operators as found under keyboard. Now, if during class today you want to use the number keypad on the right side of your keyboard, it looks like a calculator. That's totally fine. Just make sure you press the number lock key so it's turned on, okay? And you'll see that in that keypad, you have all four of those characters there or those symbols. Otherwise, if you're not going to use the numerical keypad, you'll find the same symbols in other parts of the keyboard. And if we need them, I will let you know where they are. All right. So if it's okay, if you want to use the keypad on the right, just hit the, the key that says numlock. Make sure that has, it should light up, I think. Yep, see the light? Now it's turned on. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to open up Excel. So I'm going to close this up. Now for those of you here in person, down here under Windows 11 taskbar, you will see the Excel icon. It's, a, it's an X. Go ahead and click on it to launch Excel. For those of you attending virtually, if you are doing the assignment with me at the same time, just launch Excel from whatever access point you're used to. All right, so um, for those of you who took Word uh, either Tuesday or yesterday, this might sound familiar to you. When we open up an Office program, the first thing we come to is the Start screen, which contains on the right side a template gallery. Those are built-in templates. In this case in, of Excel, they allow you to create specific types of worksheets much faster. All right, things that are more specialized, like budgets, planners and trackers, even calendars. Okay, but we're going to be building one from scratch. Now, before I click on blank workbook, I just want to remind you that on the left side, where it says recent, this is a jump list. Okay, as you start saving Excel workbooks, they will show up in this list. So if you want to begin working on it again, you can jump back into it, hence the term jump list. Okay, so now we'll, what I'd like us all to do is go to the very first template here. This is blank workbook. Go ahead and give it one single click to open it up. Okay, now I'm going to zoom in on my worksheet. Don't worry about zooming in on yours. This is so you can see mine much better. All right. So as I just showed you in the initial uh, lecture there, we have a blank worksheet. We have our vertical columns, which are identified by letter, our horizontal rows, which are identified by number. All right. Now you can fit a lot of rows. All right. And by a lot, I do mean a lot, tens of thousands and in your, uh, as far as your columns are concerned, when you get to column Z, you can still add more columns. The letters will just start to double up, A, 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 B, et cetera. So you can fit a lot of data into one sheet. And you'll notice that the active cell has an outline around it, that green outline. That, that, that just is a way of the program letting you know which cell is currently active. It will also, as you can tell, it shades in the column letter and the row number. They're slightly darker to let me know that A1 is currently the active cell. And if I was to do a range of cells, it would, sh it would expand the outline around the whole range and again indicate which columns are selected and which rows. And as far as entering data into the cells and making our way through the worksheet, we'll do that as we're building our worksheet. It'll be much easier if we're doing it at the same time, okay? Understanding how that works. Now to the right side of your worksheet, you have a vertical scroll bar all the way to the right side of your screen, which allows you to scroll up and down the worksheet as needed. Okay. There's also a horizontal scroll bar in the bottom right here. Okay. Just above your status bar. So you can scroll left and right. Now, 
always be careful as we do these um, little exercises. I'll always be sure to let you know what cell we need to be in so we're clear. Okay, but don't just kind of take the, uh, the screen for granted. If I say go to A1, instinctively you're just going to go to the top left corner. But if you look at it, it's actually B11. That's because I scroll to the right and I scroll down because you're going to start to hide rows and columns as you scroll. And there's A1 there. Okay. It sounds pretty obvious, but um, it happens a lot. Okay. That we kind of don't look at the columns and rows and we start putting stuff into the wrong cells. Now, underneath the worksheet, um, actually to the left of that scroll bar, that horizontal one, over here you have a sheet one tab. I mentioned before that you can have multiple sheets in one workbook. This is where you can create more if you need them. Next to the sheet one tab, you'll see a plus sign. If you want to click on it, you can. Otherwise, you could just watch. When I click on that plus sign, it gives me a sheet two. So now I have two sheets and I can toggle back and forth as needed. Okay. And there are several advantages to this. Basically, this system allows you to keep track of, or keep related sets of data in one file. So for example, profits in one, expenditures in another. That way I don't have to retrieve two separate files. I just retrieve one file and everything's in one place but divided by tabs, okay? Or another common use for this, dividing your budget into months of the year, January tab, February tab, March, et cetera, okay? Now, if you created that extra tab, you can just get rid of it and we could do that by right-clicking on it you'll see a menu of options and we can click on delete to get rid of that extra tab. So again, that's a right click and then a regular click onto delete. <clears throat> All right, um, underneath that tab, you do have a status bar. There's a kind of a lighter, a, a, a lighter gray bar down here, just like we had in Word. To the right, there's a zoom level. That's the only reason I'm pointing that out to you. If at any time you want to zoom in onto your worksheet or zoom out, the zoom level is the fastest and easiest way to do that. All right. Now, more importantly, let's go above the worksheet. We have this bar right here. Okay. Follow my mouse. There's a big bar right here to the left that says FX. Okay. This is your formula bar. Now, we're not really going to worry about the formula bar too much today, but the formula bar will display the contents of a cell that is selected, which is, mo which is uh, more important for formulas. Because as I showed you before, when formulas are going on, they're not going to show you the formulas on the sheet, only the answers. But the formula bar is where you will see the formula going on behind the scenes. So when we get to formulas, I'll be sure to point that out to you. And in more of our advanced Excel classes, we kind of start to go into the formula bar more often. Now above the formula bar, last but not least, is your menu of options or tools that you have for Excel. And just like other Office programs, we call this the ribbon. Okay, and the, uh, the tools, we tend to call them commands. The commands in the ribbon are organized by a series of tabs. So you'll notice that right now the home tab is currently selected. We also have an insert tab page layout, formulas, data, review, view, and help. I'm going to go back and click on the home tab. All right, so as you click on a tab, you get a different set of commands for each tab. All right, but for the most part, most of what you need to do in Excel can be done in the home tab. Now, uh, the commands in each tab are further broken down into what we call groups. So for example, in the home tab, I have these words at the bottom and those are group names. So I have a clipboard group, a font group, alignment group, number, styles, cells, and editing. All right, so throughout class, I'll, I'll always be clear about what tab we need to go to and what group we need to go to to get to the command we need. But remember, if you're still unsure, you can always point at a command icon, leave your mouse pointer there for a second, and it will tell you what it is. To the left of your home tab is your file menu, which we'll get to short, uh, shortly to save our work. But that's also where we go to start a new worksheet, perhaps open an existing one and print our sheet. 
And then the final thing I want to go over at the very tippy top in the top left corner is your quick access toolbar, which is another thing we have in all the Office programs. This allows you to add additional access points to your favorite commands so you can get to them faster. All right. There are a couple of different ways to add commands to that toolbar. The fastest way is just to right click on the command you, let, you, you want to add. And then from the menu provided, click on add to quick access toolbar. All right, so real quick, I did get a question about these icons down here in the status bar. Um, we have, these are just some quick ways to change the view of your worksheet. So by default, we're in what's called normal view, which is what's currently selected. We also have uh, page layout view and page break view. All these options are also available in your view tab in the ribbon, just kind of a faster way to get to them, okay? Um, but I would, I would say in Excel, in particular, page break view can come in handy. Because um, we want to know how many sheets of, if we want to know if we're fitting everything onto one sheet of paper, page break view can often be an easy way to make that determination without having to try, you know, going to print preview or anything. All right, but but for the but for our classes, we'll always just be using normal view. All right, so um, let's all make sure we're on cell A1, and we're going to start entering some data. All right, so we're going to be entering data down column A, A1 through A5, and we're keeping track of different types of cookies that we're selling out of our bakery. All right, so in cell A1, I'm going to type in oatmeal. So as long as the cell is active, you just start typing. Now, to go down to cell A2, you have two choices. You could either click on it with your select cursor, notice the white cross, and there it is, or you can press enter on your keyboard. Either one will do the same thing. So either click or use the enter key to go down. In this one, I have snickerdoodle. Now, as I'm typing this one, you're noticing it's not fitting into column A. That's fine. Just go down to your next cell, keep typing, and we'll resize it when we're done. Next, I have chocolate chip, followed by sugar. And then finally, ginger snap. All right, now, um, I, um,
Okay, now on purpose, um, I I left. Uh, I'm currently inside of cell A5. Do we see the blinking insertion point after the P and snap? Okay. Um, it's always a good habit because this is another thing I've seen in class many times. It's a good habit to make sure you exit the cell when you're done. Which by that I mean just click on any other cell, any other empty cell. Just exit the cell fully because if you're inside of a cell, okay, um, a lot of operations won't work. And then, you're, and then you start to think that the program's not working, but it's probably just because you're inside of the cell. So just exit the cell and then take your pause, okay? Now, um, as I mentioned, some of these cookie types are um, the length of the data value is way too long, okay? Because the, or, or another way of looking at it is the column width is too narrow. So we need to resize column A going left to right so it fits all that data. There are a few ways to adjust your column widths and your row heights. We're just going to do what's called an auto fit. Okay, so to do this, um, remember, make sure you're not inside of a cell or else this won't work. Once you've exited the cell, I want you to take your mouse, go up between the column letters A and B, like this. Between A and B. So right on the dividing line, so up into the letters. Right there, see? And you'll get a two-way arrow just like this. And that is your auto-fit cursor. Now, when you see this, go ahead and double-click on your mouse. One, two. And now the column width automatically adjusts, okay? So that's called an auto-fit. By that, it means that it fits. Um, it, uh, it's, it conforms to the size of your data. So it's not going to be too wide, so you're wasting space. And it's not going to be too narrow, so you're cutting off your data values. It's just the right amount of space you need to fit your data, again, without taking up too much space. Double click between A and B. There you go. Double click. There you go. Okay. Now, just so uh, another thing to be aware of, you can also click and drag with this to make it whatever size you want to make custom sizes, okay? So if you do want it to be wider than your longest data value, you can still do that. But the auto fit, I'm gonna double click again, will make it just the right size, which is what we wanna do for now. So we're just, especially because we wanna print it later, we don't wanna waste space on the page. All right, so as you can see, the auto fit is impacting the column to the left of the arrow. Makes sense, right? The column to the left of the two arrow is the one that's impacted. Just remember that because we're going to see that again, that little rule. Okay, <clears throat> now um, I mentioned we can click on the cells as we go down or we can press the enter key. All, just so you know, you can press the tab key to go right. Just another little tip. Okay, just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. All right. Uh, remember, uh, if I'm going in and out on the pro on the go to meeting, it's just because every so often I'm quickly turning off my microphone. All right. But if it's ever for an extended period of time, I'll be sure to let you know beforehand. OK, now we have our cookie types. So um, since we are organizing our data, something we usually do in the real world when we're organizing data, especially text data like this, is we alphabetize, OK? Like if we're inventorying, cataloging, whatever, we tend to alphabetize things. So we can kind of, it just helps us to keep uh, track of our data better. So if we need to locate a value, we know where it's going to be found in the range. So Excel will do this for you automatically. And it's something called sort or sorting. You're going to find this in your home tab. Over to the right, all the way over in the editing group, you'll see a command called sort and filter. So this is just going to be a simple sort. We're going to do more complex sorting in our pivot tables class later in the month. All right, but this is just going to be a simple one to introduce you to the concept of sorting. So the first thing you want to make sure of is 
just select any one cell in that range. Doesn't matter which one it is, any one of any any cell A1 through A5 is fine. And that's just a way of telling the program what to sort. Okay. Now let's go again. We're in our home tab. Go over to your editing group, click on sort and filter. And from the list provided, click on sort A to Z, the very first option. And now they're going to be rearranged alphabetically. As I mentioned before, notice the row numbers are still one through five. Those don't get moved, just the values inside the cells, because these cannot be changed. Numbers and letters cannot be changed. Now, another thing I often see in class that I just want to mention very quickly, and then we'll move on. If you find yourself in a situation like this, Everything is sorted alphabetically except for what's on top. This one is not in the right place. It is because you accidentally put a space for the first character in that value. Do we all see that extra space there? Okay. So that will throw off your sort. So what you would have to do is go back into the cell by double clicking. All right, double clicking allows you to go back into a cell that has data. And then we would just backspace over that extra space exit the cell, and then sort again. And then all is well. All right, just a little thing to look out for if that ever happens. All right, now the next thing I like to do is um, we're going to save in a minute. Let's just get a little more data in here. I talked earlier in the initial lecture about the importance of labels. Well, labels typically, if we're setting up column labels, which means that they're going to identify what's underneath of them, those will typically go into row one because that is the top row. But the problem is I've already used row one for this one value chocolate chip. Okay, but that's okay because in Excel we can insert new columns and rows whenever we need to. For that matter, we can also delete columns and rows. There must be a, all right, to my virtual students, give me one second, I'm turning off my microphone, I'll be right back. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, we need to put some labels into row one, which means we need a new row one and shift all this stuff down to A2 to A6 so we can have a new row one. So what we need to do now is insert a new row, which is again found in your home tab over to the right in the cells group. Do we see the cells group? That's where we go to insert new rows and columns and delete rows and columns. Insert and delete, okay? Now, in this case, the first step is to select any cell from row one. Doesn't matter which cell it is, just one cell from row one. That's because Excel is going to put the new row above the row that is currently selected. So it's our way of targeting the location of the new row. 
So we click on any cell in row one. Let's go up to our cells group. You'll see insert, but you're, you don't want to click on the insert icon. Click on the insert drop down arrow. And from the list provided, select insert sheet rows. Good. So it shifts everything down to A2 to A6 and gives us a new row one. So now in cell A1, let's call this cookies. All right, that's the label for what's underneath of it. Okay, now let's go over to cell B1. We're gonna put in a few more labels and then we're gonna fill in the rest of the data in a minute. Now what we're doing is we're keeping track of how many of each cookie are in four boxes that are in front of us. How many of each cookie type is in the four boxes in front of us, okay? So we're gonna use uh, B1 through E1 to label our boxes so we know which is which. So in cell B1, I want you to type in box one. Don't type anything else, just type in box one and stop there. Okay, now we want to put in box two, box three, box four. However, there's a faster way. We don't have to enter it all manually. So if you remember from the initial lecture, I was talking about the cursors. I talked about this is the select cursor, the big white cross. I also mentioned that black one, the fill handle. So when you click on a cell or a range of cells in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little box there. It's kind of hard to see on my screen, but there's a little green square or box in the bottom right hand corner of that selection. If I point at it, I get a fill handle. Okay, there it is again, point at it, there's the fill handle. What this does is it copies and pastes. So if I was to do this to oatmeal, I would just get another oatmeal, copy paste. However, if I do this to box one, it's gonna autofill what's called a series. It's gonna assume that I wanna keep filling in consecutive numbers which in this case I do. So click on cell B1, which it looks like you all have. Click on cell B1, and we go to the bottom right-hand corner. We get the fill handle. Once you see the fill handle, don't do anything until you see it. Click and drag over to E1, and then let go. And you have to box one, two, three, and four. And of course, you could keep going. You could pick up where you left off, do five, six, seven, et cetera. Or if you need to take away, you could take away as well if you did too many. All right, so that comes in handy for a lot of things like consecutive numbers. Let's say days of the week, if you're keeping track of you know, household chores for the week, Sunday through Saturday, uh, months of the year. So any easily predictable series or pattern, Excel is going to detect it and fill in the blanks for you. Okay. Now, um, before we start entering data, I want to save our work. All right. Um, and actually, before we even save, I want to talk about one more thing. Undo. All right. As we go further into our Excel assignment here, it's good to know about undo in case you make a mistake and you want to fix it. So in your quick access toolbar, in the very top left, there's that left turning arrow. I'm pointing at it right now. Okay, that's undo. So if you make any kind of mistake, you put something in the wrong place, okay? By clicking undo, it will put you back to where you were before. So every time you click undo, it goes back one step you took in the process of creating this worksheet. All right, so again, just reiterate, if you make a mistake, don't panic, just undo and fix it. You may have to undo a few times to get it back to where it needs to be. So with that said, now we can go ahead and save. So let's go up, back up to that quick access toolbar. 
I'm sorry, um, go to your file menu. Sorry, go to your file menu. And we're gonna on the left side, we're gonna go down to save as, click on save as. Now to the right under the big save as label here, click on the browse icon so we can browse the folders in our computer. All right, and select the folder. Now it's gonna to default to your Windows Documents folder, which I can see up here. That's okay. We could put it in any folder we want, but we're just gonna leave it there. We're gonna leave it in the Documents folder. So that we're not gonna change. What we are gonna change is down here, the file name. Right now it says book one, which is way too generic. So I want you to erase that. And let's call it Excel practice. All right, and then once you change that file name, just go down and click save. And I'm gonna get a little message, just ignore it. Okay, so um, I'm just getting a question. So um, I'm assuming the question relates to undo. So I'll just very briefly go over it again. If you make a mistake, okay, just go up to your quick access toolbar, click on the left turning arrow, and that will undo it to put it back the way it was before. Okay, and if the question pertained to saving, that was just by going to file, save as, browse, and then giving it a name, and then clicking save file, save as, browse, give it a file name, and then click save. Okay, so now we're gonna enter some data here, so bear with me one second. Okay, so for those of you attending virtually, I'm gonna shout out these numbers. Don't worry, they're all single digits, very simple. I'm gonna work down the columns, starting with B2 and going down to B6, and then I'll move over to column C, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so I'm gonna have three, two, three, two, two. Now I'm gonna click on cell C2. where we have one, two, three, four, two. Now I'll click on cell D2, five, two, two, one, two. And then cell E2, four, oops, I made a mistake there, let me fix that. Four, two, three, two, one. I'll leave that there for a minute so you can catch up and then we will get started again.
Okay, now we have our data filled in. And you can see, of course, how this is working. Remember, where the cells intersect is how we can make sense of this data. So, for example, in box three, I have how many oatmeal? Two, right? Because that's where they intersect. In box four, I have how many snickerdoodle? Two, because that's where those two values intersect. All right. <clears throat> so now we have all of our data filled in. Now we can get to the fun part, formulas. Give me one, sorry folks, give me one second. I'm gonna turn off my mic for just one second. Okay, so we're going to do two formulas. There are two things I want to know, and Excel is going to tell me. First, I want to know how many of each, uh, or I'm sorry, how many cookies are in each box, okay? How many cookies are in each box? So if we look at our data, well, first of all, we know we're going to add, right? We're just going to add up the values to give us a total. But are we going to be adding down the column or right across a row? How many cookies are in each box? Well, if our box labels are set up as columns, then we're going to be adding up these values here. We're going down the column. So we're going to put our formula in row seven. But before we do that, let's set up a label so we know what it is when we get the answer. So I'm going to click on cell A7 under sugar. And in that cell, I want you to put in total. All right, and then just exit that cell for now. And now let's get into formulas. So there are a few ways we can uh, set up this formula. We're going to use something called a function. Okay. So remember that, first of all, all formulas begin with the equal sign. So if I was to kind of type this out, um, uh, sort of like in the most basic way, I would be saying equals B2 plus B3 plus B4 plus B5 plus B6 to give me an answer. Okay, but there's the, a faster way. We're going to use something called a function. So Excel has, um, in the program, there are built-in functions. Functions are basically mathematical calculations um, that have sort of kind of shorthand names. Okay, so we select the function we need based on the calculation we need, and then we just plug in the data values, and Excel will take care of the rest. And it just saves a little bit of work, and you'll see what I mean in just a second. So to get to your functions, we can get to them at a couple places. We're going to stick to the Home tab. So in your Home tab, make sure you're in cell. Um, actually, don't worry about that just yet. Just go up to your Home tab, make sure we're in the right place, and to the right, you will see the Editing group, just like where we saw Sort and Filter before. But we're also going to see a tool called AutoSum. Now, don't click on AutoSum. I want you to click on the drop down next to AutoSum. There's a drop down arrow. Okay, and you'll see a few other names here. These are functions the sum function, the average function, count numbers, etc. And there are many, many more, okay, nearly 200 functions. You can get to them all by clicking on more functions here. And you'll see the entire library of functions, and they're all organized by different categories, from basic to very advanced. All right, if you've opened this, just go to the bottom right and click Cancel to close it. Now, you can also get to functions, just so you know, if you're kind of exploring. You can get to all the functions by going to your Formulas tab in the ribbon. 
and you'll see the function library group here. Same thing, all categorized, just in a different layout. All right, but let's just get back to the sheet. So let's go back to the Home tab. Click on your Home tab. So the, um, the first thing we're going to do, um, let's tell the program what we want to put into that function, what values we want to add. So let's start with B2. Now you're not using your fill handle this time because we're not copying and pasting. We're just selecting the cells. So you want your white cross, the select cursor. And we're going to click and drag B2 to B6 like this. Okay, if you grab B7, that's okay, but you don't need to. So B2 to B6, so now we're telling the program to incorporate these values into a formula. In this case, because we're adding, we need the sum function. So go back up to that editing group and click right on the icon that says auto sum. That's actually the one we need because that's the one that's used so often. So they put that one right there. Click on auto sum. And you should have a 12 in cell B7. You got it. See the 12? All right. Now, let's just look at this formula for one second, and then we're going to uh, and then we're going to calculate the remaining boxes. So if you click on cell B7, and B, just click on cell B7, so that's the only active cell. If you look up in your formula bar, you're going to see what's called the syntax, the way the program is spelling out the formula to do it properly. All right, it looks a little bit strange, but that's just kind of the language Excel uses. Click on cell B7. So that's the only cell selected. Yep, where the 12 is. Nope, next one over, right there. Now look in your formula bar, see that? You're just looking at it. Okay, now I'm gonna show it to you up close by double clicking on this cell. This is what it says in the formula bar. If you do this and you double click on your cell, be very careful. Don't click on anything else because you might corrupt the formula. But this is what it does, equal sign first, followed by the function name, which is sum. And then whenever we use a function, the cell range has to be enclosed in parentheses. That's a must. So in the parentheses, we have B2 to B6. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, you don't always have to use functions. And if you don't use a function, you don't need parentheses. But if I didn't use a function, remember, I would have had to do this like this, equals B2 plus B3 plus B4, et cetera, et cetera, which is just much more time consuming, okay? By doing it like this, it just needs a range, B2 to B6, instead of all the cells in between. It just uses the, end, the beginning, the uh, starting point, and the end point, and grabs everything in between. Does that make sense? So by using a function, we can just establish a range instead of having to identify each individual cell. Now, if you're inside the cell like I am right now, I would advise you to just press enter to safely exit the cell. Okay, and as you notice, by the way, I kind of just typed it right back in. That's because we could always go back and we can make adjustments manually which is something we're going to do in a couple other Excel classes, more advanced ones. All right, but for now, we're just keeping it simple. Now, we want to apply that same formula to the other three boxes. So once again, we don't need to do it manually. We can just basically copy-paste, okay? So I want you to click on B7 where the 12 is. And once again, let's use our fill handle. So go to the bottom right, point at the little box. When you get that fill handle, that black cross, I want you to click and drag over to E7, let go. All right, and there we go. So what we were doing was we were verifying that all boxes had a dozen cookies. If it didn't, then we would know, let's eliminate one or two, or we need to add one or two. Okay. Now, it looks like it just copied and pasted the 12, but it didn't. It just so happens that these all add up to 12. All right, look at the ranges. B2 to B6, C2 to C6. 
okay? We're going to talk about this in more detail in future classes. It's called relative referencing. But don't worry about that right now. Just know that by using the fill handle, it applies that formula equally across your data range. Okay, now let's do one more just to get a little more practice. Suppose I want to know the average number of each cookie type across all four boxes. So the average number of chocolate chips, the average number of ginger snaps, et cetera, et cetera. So this time, am I working down a column or right across a row? I'm going right across a row. So we're going to put our formula in column F. But before we do that, let's set up a label. So click on cell F1. Go ahead and click on cell F1. And we're going to type in average. OK. So once again, we're going to use a function. And here's another advantage to use a function, by the way. Average is a slightly more complicated calculation. So if you don't know how to build uh, an average, like how to type it out, then you may as well just let Excel do it for you. Because all we have to do is plug in the numbers. So first thing we're going to do is tell Excel what cells we want to use in our formula. So let's remember, you're using the select cursor, the white cross. Click and drag B2 to E2, like this. Not the fill handle. If you use the fill handle, just undo and do it again. White select cursor. All right, then we're going to go back up. We're in the home tab over to the right to that editing group. Remember where we clicked on auto sum. This time I want you to click on the drop down because we need a different function this time. We don't need sum, we need average. So click on the drop down. And from the list provided, click on average, the second one down. All right, so there we have our average for chocolate chip, 3.25. And once again, just so you can see, there's the syntax, same thing, except instead of sum, it says average. That's the function name. So all, f um, for the most part, when we build formulas like this, even more complex ones, they're built the same way. Equals, function name, cell range, and close the parentheses. Those are the basics, okay? So now we want to apply this formula to the other uh, cookies. And we may as well include the total as well, so we can get a total average, or average total, I should say. So click on cell F2, so that's your only cell, cell F2. Good, now go to the bottom right. This time you do want the fill handle, point at the little box, get that black cross, click and drag down to F7 and let go.
So now we know the average number of ginger snaps are two, oatmeal, 2.75, snickerdoodle, 2.25, sugar, 1.75. Okay, our formulas are done. And we'll, we're going to revisit these again in Excel Essentials next week. Don't worry. Those are the basics. Now what I'd like to do is some formatting. I want to make this look a little bit, I don't know, a little bit more presentable, I guess we could say. Okay, a little more interesting to look at. So the first thing I'd like to do is I'm not happy with these decimals. I want these numbers to be whole numbers. So I want, in other words, I want Excel to round these up or down. So 3.25, I want it to be three. 2.75, I want that to be three as well, because that's gonna round up, okay? So we're gonna get rid of the decimal places. We don't need to do this manually. This is actually a formatting tool, all right? Excel will just change the way the number is being displayed or the way the number is being sort of read and interpreted. So the first thing we have to do is select the cells that have the decimals in them. So even though this this two here, you could just grab that just so you could do it in one click and drag. It would just have no effect on the two, which is fine. Okay. And now we want to just decrease the decimal places to no decimal places. And we have how many decimal places? Two. So in our home tab, we have here the number group, kind of right in the middle. We see the number group, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll do more with this next week, but for now, you're gonna see two icons here. There's a left arrow that's, if you point at it, it will say increase decimal, and a right arrow, if you point at it, that says decrease decimal. So we have two decimal places, which means we need to click on this two times. So click on decrease decimal once, twice, and then we're down to just a whole number. If you it, no, if you clicked on the left arrow, you went in the opposite direction. So just click on the right arrow until you're down to just one whole number. So we should have three, two, three, two, two, twelve at the bottom. All right, now after all this hard work, let's do a quick save and we'll do a little more formatting. So to do a quick save, just go up to your quick access toolbar in the top left corner. In the very top left, you'll see a disk. Click on it to do a quick save. Otherwise, if you don't see that, you could also just go to your file menu and click save from the list here. Either one will do the same thing. All right, next thing I'd like to do is I want to give my uh, table here a title, okay? So we are going to, um, I want the title to be on the worksheet. We have a similar problem we had earlier in class, which is row one is already taken. That's the top row. So if I wanted, if I wanted to put a title above my data, it has to go here. So once again, we need to insert a new row. So remember the rule, we need to select any cell from row one. So click any cell in row one. And then we went up, to, we're in the home tab still, go to your cells group. Remember, we were looking for insert, but don't click on the insert icon, click on the insert drop down. And then from the list provided, select insert sheet rows. Insert sheet rows. Good. Okay. And you'll notice Excel just updated the cell references. Okay. They didn't, uh, by inserting that new row, it didn't mess up the formula. So what was B2 to B6 before is now B3 to B7. So Excel just automatically updated the cell references accordingly. So we don't have to worry about things getting messed up. All right. So. Now let's go up to row one. We still have one more problem. I want my title 
to be centered above my table. But that's going to be impossible because I have a whole bunch of individual cells with boundaries in between them or borders in between them. But what we can do is merge a bunch of cells together so that we just have, you know, continuous space inside of it. So the first thing we need to do is select the cells that we want to merge. So that's going to be A1 to F1. So remember, we're not using the fill handle. You're just using your regular select cursor, A1 to F1 like this. Good. Now, up in your home tab, in the alignment group, because we're talking about wanting to center things, all right, so we go to the alignment group, and we'll see a tool right here called Merge and Center. You could just click right on Merge and Center itself. Merge and Center. Click right on it. You got it. Good. Right there, merge. Yep, you just had it. Merge and center. Click. Right there. All right. Now, I want you to double click into that big cell so we can get inside of it. And you'll see that your cursor is already centered. So it did both things at once. It merged the cells we selected and centered our alignment. So now let's type in our title. Smart, oops, Smart Cookie Bakery. Double click into that cell. There you go, and just start typing. All right, now, for now, just exit the cell. And we still wanna just maybe jazz it up just a little more. So we'll just do some light formatting, give it a little more color maybe. So go. So now click on that title cell again. I had you do that on purpose, exit first, because I don't wanna be inside of it, I wanna be on it. That's why we clicked outside and then went back to it. So we're on the cell. So we're going to do a few things. We're going to make the font size a little bit bigger. And we'll change the color in the cell. All right. So up in your home tab, in your font group this time, which has a lot of the same commands we find in Microsoft Word, your font group, you'll see the 11, your font size. Yep, we're going to make that a 14. So you can either type 14 into the box and press enter or click on the drop down and just select 14 from this list. All right, and then also in the font group, you'll see an icon with a paint bucket. It has a little yellow line under it. That's fill color. That's how you can fill in the cell with a color. So click on the drop down arrow next to the paint bucket and you'll get more color options. And just select the color from the palette and click when you find one you like. Now remember, don't go crazy. Unfortunately, we do not have a color printer. All right, this is just for practice. All right, now we're gonna do one more thing in terms of formatting and then we're gonna, going to add a little bit of information before we print. All right, I want to format my labels. So A2 over to F2. So go ahead and select A2 to F2. Good. All right, we want to do three things here. 
first, let's go to the font group again. Click on the B for bold. Okay. Um, let's go back to that paint bucket, to that fill color. Give it a different color than what you just did for the title. And then, last but not least, go to your alignment group where we have left, center, and right alignment. I'm pointing at them right now. Click on center alignment so it looks like this. Now we have one more label called total. We want it to look like these labels. All right, but I'm going to show you a little trick so we don't have to do all that again. In your home tab, in your clipboard group, all the way to the left, that's usually where we go to cut, copy, and paste. But there's another command in there called Format Painter. And that basically will copy and paste formatting options onto something else. So follow my lead. I'll Let me demonstrate first, and then I'll do it again. First, you select in this case, the cell that has the formatting you like. So that can be anything from A2 to F2, doesn't matter. So let's just say I pick A2. Next, I click on Format Painter. Finally, I click on the cell that I want to apply those options to, which would be A8, where it says Total. And there we go. So I'll do it again. Step one, click on any cell that has the formatting options you want. So you could just click on A2 if you want to do the same thing I am. Next step, go up to your clipboard group, click on Format Painter. So you're turning it on. Then in step three, go down, click on the cell you want to apply those options to, which is A8, where it says Total. And that's it. Good. OK. And a little trick. Um, if you double click on Format Painter, it will stay on. So you could just keep clicking on more cells and keep applying those options. And then when you're done, you could go up and click on it to turn it off. All right, but in this case, because we were only applying it to one thing, we just did a single click. All right, so now this is looking much better. So now let's get this set up for printing. Um, let's do one last quick save. Click on that Save Disk in the top left corner or go to File and click Save here. All right, now, you don't have to do this. I'm just going to show you on my screen very quickly the th uh, some of the things we're going to change before we print. If I print it out without making any changes to the layout, this is what it's going to look like, which is not so great. It's very small. We have a lot of room on the page, so we may as well make it bigger. It's also tucked in the top left corner, which I don't really like. I'll, maybe I want it to be centered on the page. Um, and the grid lines are also missing, which separates one cell from the next, which I like to have the grid lines personally. Oh, and the, I almost forgot. Um, this is set up as portrait orientation. See how the page is arranged vertically, long sides on the left and right? Typically in Excel, in my experience, it comes out better if you print in landscape, which is when the page is set up horizontally, so the long edges are on the top and bottom. So we're gonna make all those changes. If you're in this screen, just go to the top left, click on the back button. We're going to do it from here. Okay. I want you to click on your page layout tab in the ribbon. So go to your page layout tab. And here in the page setup group, right underneath the tab, the first thing we're going to do is click on orientation and change it to landscape. So click on landscape. All right, now I want you to click on margins. So orientation, landscape, and then go to margins.
You got it. Landscape. Yep. All right, then go to margins. Right next to orientation is margins. Right there. Yep. Now this one's a little tricky. We need to go to a separate menu. And you'll see this a lot in office um, drop downs like this. At the bottom, it says custom margins. Click on that. At the very bottom, it says custom margins. Keep going down. Nope. So this launches a dialog box, okay? And for your information, all the things we're doing right now can all be done in this by dialog box, all right? But for the purposes of what Excel, of how, ex well, kind of like what Excel, how, how they want you to do it, especially if you plan on taking the assessment, hint, hint, we're doing most of this from the page layout tab. But in this dialog box, this is the only place we can do this. You'll see we're in the margins tab down below. It's the center on page check off both boxes horizontally and vertically, and that's what's going to center it on the page. Once you do that, just click OK at the bottom of that dialog box. Okay, um, another thing we're going to do, go over to the group called Scale to Fit, and this is where we can make it bigger, all right, to kind of magnify it, to take up a little more space on the page, may as well. So you'll see 100% scale, so that's where you can create a custom scaling, all right. Now, usually this takes a bit of trial and error to get it just right, but because I've done this before, I know that 150 will work. So just change that 100% to a 150. You can either type into the box and press enter or use the up arrow and just click a few times until you get to 150. Last but not least, next to that, the next group is called sheet options. Okay, sheet options, you'll see grid lines. View is turned on so I can see them on the screen, but print is turned off. So click on the box for print to add them to the printed copy as well. Now I want you to do one more thing. I promise it's gonna be quick and then we're done. This is for the purposes of knowing whose is whose. I want you to go to your insert tab in the ribbon All right, over to the right in the text group, click on header and footer. Your view's gonna change. Your view's gonna change, don't worry about it. We'll fix that in a second. Now you're gonna see three boxes at the top of the screen. We're just gonna keep it simple. You're already in the center box. Just type in your first and last name. All right, and now to exit the header and footer, um, just um, let's do this. Go to your sheet, 
click anywhere on the sheet outside of the header. Just so click on one of these cells, okay? Go up to your view tab in the ribbon. The view tab, not review, just view. And in the view tab, over to the left, in the workbook views group, click on normal, and you'll be back to the normal view. And then you could do one last quick save. And then we are all set to print. So let's go to the file menu. And on the left side, about halfway down, click on print. And this is what it looks like now. Much more presentable, at least to me. All right. So you guys, if you're happy with the way it looks, you can go ahead and click on the big print button and we'll collect them. All right, so as long as you're happy with the way it looks, you can click on the big print button and you're all set with that worksheet. And that concludes Introduction to Excel. Okay, now remember, there is that handout available for my virtual students. You have that handout in the same email containing your link to the class. Okay, so you could use that for practicing and there's gonna be a recording of this on our YouTube channel. And then, of course, you're welcome to sign up for Excel Essentials next week. We have it Wednesday night at 6, Thursday afternoon at 2. You could take one or both. It's up to you. And if you uh, come to Excel Essentials and you're confident in your abilities and you get through the whole class, you're welcome to sign up for the Excel assessment where you can, uh, with an 85% or higher, you can earn your Excel certificate from North Star Digital Literacy. Oops, I didn't mean to open that. All right, so... At this time, um, for my virtual students, I'm going to be ending the recording, but you're welcome to stay on for a few minutes if you have any questions. All right, so again, thank you for coming to Intro to Excel, and we'll see you next time.